Hi. Thank you for joining us at WH2O tonight at 11. We're excited to introduce to you the new documentary produced by What Gobstoppers and directed by celebrity figure Adam Smith. Adam, take the wheel. Why, hello there. Feeling comfortable in your mass-produced seat? Have clean clothes and a good education? Enjoy your equal gender and racial rights? Well, guess what? That wasn't the case in the Industrial Revolution. Heck, your children would be working in a factory 24-7 if it wasn't for the Factory Act of 1833. Don't know what that is? Well, before I tell you, why don't I educate you first on the Industrial Revolution? More specifically, life before. Before the Industrial Revolution, peasant families were living in conditions remarkably similar to those of their ancestors before. unpaid worker. Crops are hard to grow with our bare hands. We're a peasant family, so we're poor. And I can't even go out to work. I'm reduced to a household appliance. I have no rights! Your mother's right, especially about the no rights part. But I just want some dinner. And I just want some rights, you small peasant child, but we can't always get what we want in this cruel world. Sucks to be you guys. I'm a man, so I can do whatever I want because I have all the power. Hey guys, I'm the Black Death. Just gonna run through Europe real quick, kill off a third of the population, you know, because you guys are super unsanitary and don't know how to clean yourselves. It's a good thing I had 13 kids. Oh, damn. Oh, 12. How do you feel about the prospects of the future? The future? Well, it doesn't really feel that bright. I mean, life is pretty hard. It's difficult to keep the family going, and then also have to do manual labor for food and keep up with the changing weather on top of that. It's the same situation for a lot of us, as the majority of the population are peasants. There's no way that we can move up in the classes, which is probably due to the feudal structure here. I might have to start looking for waged work outside the home, maybe in a mine, possibly in the growing textile industry. Most of us are illiterate, so I don't expect any changes or revolutions to happen anytime soon. I think this is bad. Let's take a look at other parts of pre-industrial society. Who can you back all the power? The divine right, loser! But wait, the Earth isn't the center of the universe. It revolves around the sun. You were wrong all along. Shut up and enjoy house arrest! As you can see, the upper class consisted mostly of the king and the church, as they claimed to have authority from the divine right. The divine right is the belief that God had given individuals in power the right to come to power. Anyone in the lower classes that opposed them were persecuted and burned at the stake, even though their opinions were correct a majority of the time. However, things began to change in the 17th and 18th centuries. The main reason why the Industrial Revolution began in England was due to the introduction of high-yielding crops, such as potatoes and corn, from their colonies in the New World. These high-yielding crops led to more food surpluses and the agricultural revolution in the 18th century. In addition to food surplus, this revolution was defined by the creation of new machines for plowing, seeding, and reaping. Along with the development of chemical fertilizers, allowed farmers to greatly increase the amount of land they could farm, while decreasing the number of people needed. Combining food surplus and more free time allowed people to do other things than farm all day, such as Demographies shifted as well, as both adult and infant mortality rates fell. Fertility rates eventually fell as well. People generally had less children. The creation of new classes allowed some individuals to focus on things other than food and power. During the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, people began to use their energy and labor to question the church and expose the faults in the scientific and political beliefs of the time. They may have placed me under house arrest, but I shall continue studies nonetheless. Yeah! If the church is wrong about one thing, then they can be wrong about divine right and how the government should run. Yeah! yeah. Woo! That means they shouldn't persecute us if we differ from their beliefs. Yeah. yeah! That means that humans are inherently evil and require a monarch to take away their rights. Woo! Woo. Woo. Don't get their maps! Woo! New ideas led to a variety of economic changes. Before the Industrial Revolution, the ebbing and flowing of periods of prosperity and recession were easily described using Thomas Malthus's theory. See, it's all very simple. When populations drop as they do during times of scarcity, the amount, the availability of labor goes down, and the amount that people will pay for labor rises. When wages rise as a result, more laborers are more prosperous and can therefore sustain more children. This drives up the total population. However, when the population rises, so does the availability of labor, which causes wages to drop. This again leads to a period of scarcity and depression, and the vicious cycle continues forevermore. Due to this vicious cycle, both wage and population size remained relatively the same from the Middle Ages up to 1750. 
as a result of the new ideas and inventions that were created during the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, a new period arose in Europe called the Industrial Revolution. A period that began in the mid 18th century in Britain and spread rapidly through the 19th century. It is defined by a series of change from manual labor to large scale factory production. During this time, wages grew in comparison to past centuries, while fertility rates decreased. This was a challenge to Thomas Malthus's notions of economy, which were created during the Industrial Revolution. During the Industrial Revolution, a new class structure was created. The top class consisted of new aristocrats who became rich from industrial success. A new middle class formed, made up of managers, accountants, ministers, lawyers, doctors, and other skilled professionals. The bottom of the structure was the working class, made up of factory workers in cities and peasant farmers in the countryside. I mean, life seems so much better now. Most of my friends who were peasants worked up the social structure and became factory workers. And although women and children have much lower wages, much more working hours, and worse working conditions compared to adult males, it's still better than staying in the house all day. In addition to the new class structure, several inventions throughout the course of the Industrial Revolution had a positive impact on the industries they were involved in. Let's take a look at our first invention, the cotton gin, invented by Eli Whitney in 1791. Take more time, you dim-witted poor slaves. Why don't you do this to us, master? I imported you from Lufaland. I saved you. And I want 90 more baskets of cotton from each of you by tonight. How are we going to accomplish this? Look to the inventors. They will guide you. Ooh. Why don't we take this one? Sir, we separated about 4,500 baskets for you. Well, well done. How'd you do all this? Hi, I'm Eli Whitney. This is my new invention, the cotton gin. The cotton gin makes separating cotton from its seeds so much easier and faster than doing it by hand. Now you can produce even more cotton than usual. My machine improved the amount of materials produced and it was done faster. Whoa, let's call up my man Watt using my electric telegraph. It was approved upon by Alessandro Volta in 1800 when he created the Voltaic Pile and made sure to use Morse code, which was created by Samuel Morse in 1838. Hello? Hey guys, what's up? I'm currently on a steam-powered train that's using my new steam engine, which contains a separate condenser. The original steam engine was created by Thomas Newcomen. My improvements have increased the efficiency, power, and speed of locomotives and many other machines. The steam engine allowed for faster production of materials and faster deliveries. When people look at railroads and locomotives with my engine in it, they feel a sense of power over nature. It really helps with the spirits of people who aren't too excited for the future. Just like my steam engine, many of the inventions of the time gave people hope. These inventions had an effect that went beyond the factory. Welcome to school. Our second invention is the spinning jet, invented by James Hargreaves in 1764. I wish we could produce more cloth in a shorter period of time. It would make life so much easier. Wait, what's this? I don't know. Just choose something. Hi there, my name is James. This right here is the spinning jenny. Oh, not her. <laughs> I created the spinning jenny so it could use more spindles, thus allowing for the creation of more cloth. At first, it could use up to 8 spindles, but further improvements allowed for the use of more than 120. Yes, Hargreaves' spinning jenny was influential in the clothing industry, which was the most important industry of the early Industrial Revolution. It was further improved upon after Richard Arkwright invented the water frame. This spinning jenny is incredible. I just wish this thread was stronger and more durable. <gasps> oh, yo, it's back! Choose that one. Yes, yes. It is I, Sir Richard Arkwright. I have created the water frame, causing exponential improvement upon Mr. Hardcream's spinning jenny. My new machine can hold up to 128 spindles and create much stronger and harder yarn, leading to long-lasting clothes and materials. Another important invention of the time was the assembly line. This process was meant for each part of the product to be created individually, one person per part, and then assembled by another person. This division of labor was important because it required specification of labor, so each person became an expert at creating their specific part. And because it led to mass production in many industries, I wrote about it at length in my book, The Wealth of Nations. One important figure of the time was Josiah Wedgwood, who was widely regarded as the father of marketing. Eli Whitney and Henry Ford also had substantial effects in factories where their use of mechanization and the assembly line led to higher profits in the industries that used their system. Mechanization allowed for more cost-effective and efficient production, two important advantages. There was also Abraham Darby, who created a fuel called coke that was much more efficient than coal, in addition to new inventions in the industry world. New social theories came about during the Industrial Revolution, one of which was social Darwinism, 
Hello there, I created the new theory of natural selection in 1859. That the species with the best qualities will survive in the environment, or survival of the fittest. Hello, Mr. Darwin! I am a social Darwinist, and I definitely agree with your theory of survival of the fittest, but I would apply it to society as a whole. Those who are at the top of the societal pyramid deserve to be there because they were born with the best traits. This explains why England should rule all other countries, and why men are just generally born better than women. And it also explains why just people have more power than others. Exactly. I wrote this book called The White Man's Burden, where I talked about how European imperialization and exploitation of other countries is totally justified. Wait, but that's not how it works. Yeah, come on. What about oppressive class structures? Shouldn't we be able to work to the best of our ability and live in a mer meritocratic society? Listen, you stinky liberalist. Merit is intrinsically connected to our genetics. Isn't it suspicious that such a belief would only benefit the upper class? What about the rising middle class? Yeah, what about us factory workers? This would be perfect to pair with my greatest happiness principle. Perhaps we should analyze the situation using the scientific method. Who are you? A positivist. I believe that we should use the scientific me method to verify every statement, since it, since it is an absolute and infallible method. We should utilize my greatest happiness principle. Someone, please explain to me what's going on. Wouldn't it be best if we maximize the total amount of pleasure that exists within the world? All action should be guided towards maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. This is how we should evaluate whether or not consequences are good or bad just by the quality of those consequences. Very interesting concept. <laughs> the greatest happiness principle was developed further into socialist ideas during the Industrial Revolution. Marx and Engels, the fathers of communism, gained popularity only a decade after the end of the Industrial Revolution. It was during the Industrial Revolution that distinct business cycles could be observed in the economy. These were outlined using the principles of classical economics that I inspired. Business cycles have four phases. Prosperity, liquidation, recession, and recovery. During a period of prosperity, the rates of productivity, wages, employment, profits, and investments all rise. Such periods are connected to the creation of new technology. However, limitations on demand and the availability of raw materials end up limiting prosperity. This drives the economy into a period of liquidation. As supply overtakes demand, prices decline, employment decreases, and investment rates drop. The economy then moves towards a period of recession. Recovery begins when the consumer demand increases or factory inventories are exhausted, increasing the need to purchase and create goods. This needs fuel the economy and begins another period of prosperity. Oh look, it's David Ricardo! Oh hello, are we talking about economic theory? Hey Malthus! Greetings, friend of mine! Isn't it a wonderful day to institute protectionist policies over tariffs and exports? I personally oppose such protect protectionist policies. What about supporting a labor-based theory of value, which states that the cost of items is directly related to the amount of labor it took to create them? Clearly, that is far inferior to the cost of production-based theory of value, where we consider wages and other costs of when, other costs when determining the prices of items. You seem like a great guy to write a theory of rents with. Why not determine the differences in land productivity when the products feed the same market and how it informs the price of rent with me? We could do it by arguing over letter. Only if I take the credit for it. Wouldn't it be slightly contradictory if I had higher levels of mental productivity, but you got the social benefit, or rent, for it? Nobody ever said we had to follow what we had to pay for. I mean, just look at history. Although there were new inventions, ideas, and systems from the Industrial Revolution that helped mass production, there was also poor treatment that existed in factories. The members of the working class saw factory owners gain wealth quickly at their own expense. They now realized that the owners did not inherit their position, but instead achieved success by exploiting their workers. Ever since we got all these new machines, Willy Wonka wanted more and more cotton and cloth from us. There's no way we can get this all done. Well, at least you can still work. My arm's broken and my family's starving. Hey, is that complaining here? I don't think you guys made it to a mouth lays around. By the way, weren't there three of you? You mean Lil Loompa? He died trying to work with those dirty, unpaid machines. Poor kid, he didn't even get paid as much as we did. Yeah, yeah, boo-hoo. You guys have about, I'd say, 14 to 16 more hours of working for me. Get back to work. But sir, my arm! You'll be fine. Quit your whining. Now, if you keep complaining, I'll cut your pay. This was often the case in factories during the Industrial Revolution. Using very dangerous machinery that produced smoke and soot, and working long periods of time per day, workers often suffered many injuries and even deaths. Owners prioritized their earnings and production over the safety and wages of their workers. This would change in the 19th century, however, through a group of reforms passed by Parliament. I've got the perfect thing for you! We're passing a new act! What? The Factory Acts of 1833! We're stopping some of this! We have decided to stop young children from work, cut down the hours. Older children are allowed to work, stop children from working at night, and require that children have two hours of schooling a day. <laughs> and Willy Wonka will actually follow that. And that's why we're hiring 
factory inspectors. They actually make sure that all factory owners follow the new rules. Hallelujah! Only Lil Wolf would see us now. But what about us? <laughs> Just give it a minute. Much, much, much later. There we go. The Mines Act of 1842. And what does it do? Well, now all children under the ages of 10 can't work in the mines. Oh, and women aren't allowed to work in the mines anymore. Seriously, how am I supposed to make a living? Oh, who cares? The more men we have working for us, the more we can fight for universal male suffrage. But what about us? We don't have any rights. Don't you think you- Oh, and you know what we could do? You people are horrible to your- This miner was one of the many men who were a part of the Chartist movement. This was a movement that wanted to gain political rights and influence for the working class. It was especially focused on gaining universal male suffrage, which would allow all men to vote regardless of their income level, race, or religion. What you heard the miner listing off was the six main points that Chartists fought for. These can all be found in the People's Charter, a petition created by William Lovett and Francis Place for the London Working Men's Association. This petition was signed by millions and was brought before Parliament three times. However, it was rejected each time. While the Chartist movement failed without achieving its goal, the demands of the Chartists were incorporated into later reform acts. Although everything seems fine and dandy for men, women did not enjoy the Industrial Revolution as much. Okay, which way should we go? Hmm. Probably left, because women have no rights. While men were celebrating their equal rights in the factory and voting rights, women were pushed aside because they were not regarded as equal to men. However, during the Industrial Revolution, women were offered jobs outside the home, which was contrary to their traditional role of housewives. After men received equal racial rights in the factory, most women were seen as no longer needed in the factory, and they returned to their traditional housewife roles. Education, real wages, and high-paying job opportunities were not accessible to women during the Industrial Revolution, as they were still stuck with their traditional role of taking care of the house. However, the women's emancipation movement did start to take place during the Industrial Revolution, which was a movement that pushed for women's political and legal equality. Women were not unaffected by the Enlightenment ideals of freedom, equality, and liberty, and early feminist writers emerged in this period in Western Europe. Both middle and working class women joined reform movements, labor unions, and social parties. Let's look at a few effects of industrialization on cities. There was rampant disease in working class neighborhoods, which include diseases like tuberculosis, typhoid, and more. The Poor Law of 1834 created poor houses for those that were too poor to afford their own housing. Industrial cities became sources of wealth because their factories were concentrated there. There were life expectancies as low as 26 in Liverpool. The emergence of a middle class occurred, which resulted in lower family size among families, as children were viewed as an economic burden. Law wages were increased near the end of the Industrial Re Revolution, mainly for men. The Factory Acts passed from 1802 to 1842, mostly benefited children and women, but also could benefit men. Britain became a food importer to feed the growing populations in cities. The layout of cities changed. Upper middle class families lived on the outer edge of cities and had individual houses. Lower middle class families lived in the inner ring of cities to have smaller terraced housing. Working class families lived in the center of the cities and had small connected housing. The poor law commissioners did detailed inspections of housing, which led to sanitation laws. To conclude, let's catch up with the family that we have been following. Wow, Ellis Island looks amazing. I'm glad the idea of the steam engine spread from England to America and allowed them to create more advanced versions of the steamboat. Yeah, and the ideas of capitalism and laissez-faire from England were revised and edited for America, where the concepts are, are still in use today. The Industrial Revolution had so many positive effects on America and England, especially on the middle class. The middle class was able to work their way up their social ladder, had reasonable wages, a new variety of jobs in, to work in, and better access to education. Although women were robbed of the rights they had gained at the end of the Industrial Revolution, it was still a major step in woman power. Wow, what a great time to be alive in. Thank you, Adam. And now, we cut to a reporter covering one of the greatest natural disasters to plague our country, Hurricane Fioca. Take it away, pal. It's getting really bad out here, guys. Hurricane Fioca is one of the worst that we've ever seen on West Bottom. The Leston home down south just got knocked down. Please, if you can, donate $5 to the Franchetti Foundation to help these poor families. <laughs> 